Hello, I'm Juliet Mann and this is the Agenda podcast, CGTN Europe's one-stop shop for smart, in-depth discussion of the issues that really matter in the world today. The global economy has been weakened by a series of crises. COVID-19, conflict, high inflation, distress in the banking sector, growth remains sluggish. But despite deepening tensions geopolitically and the cost of living crisis remaining acute around the world, there are some growth hotspots. So which countries are driving growth and investment over the next decade? At the World Economic Forum's Growth Summit 2023 in Geneva, I spoke to Mamusi Kigafela, Minister of Investment, Trade and Industry of Botswana, the President of Turkey's Investment Office, Eburak Daliolu, and Karen Harris, Managing Director of the Macro Trends Group at Bain & Company. As we speak, there is such an uncertain economic backdrop, isn't there? I mean, is your outlook for the global economy still doom and gloom or are things going to perk up a bit in 2023? I think there's a lot of um, room for improvement. We shouldn't look at it as altogether doom. Um, w when we look at, for instance, our entry or into, an, into the African continental free trade um, area agreement, which is the largest since the WTO was formed, uh, the whole objective of it is to uh, integrate the rest of Africa from Cairo to Cape so that we could then um, jointly grow together. There are many other regional agreements that we have in, in, in Southern Africa. For instance, we have the Southern African Customs Union and the SADC, um, SADC agreement. Uh, I think you know, if we properly implement those agreements and um, um, collaborate with one another, uh, there is plenty of room for, 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 for growth. And Africa is the new market. Uh, it's a market which has not been uh, exploited before. Uh, it is now time for it to be exploited, and we're inviting Europeans and Americans to, to look into Africa. Uh, it is, especially in, in Botswana, um, being known for our peace and, and stability, our fiscal, uh, our fiscal discipline. It is a, a very, and, and, the, and the vast um, amount of space available for food production, uh, green energy uh, and production. It is a pro, uh, quite a, an appropriate um, place at, from which you know, some, um, advanced technology, those, those companies which advance technologically can, uh, can springboard from to access the greater African market. So Botswana, Southern Africa, the, the continent of Africa, yes. open for business. Um, yes. Karen, I wonder what your take is on this. I mean, what do you see um, as the, the key global hotspots, but also the challenges that are going to be affecting international trade and investment? I think part of the reason there's such a doom and gloom story is that we're in this interesting period where we're at the end of this business cycle that was bizarrely fast as the world closed and then reopened and sort of bumbled its way into what looks like a recession, certainly in North America and in and Europe now going forward. But at the same time, we are at the end of some important secular forces that are also transformational and really will help us guide us in this next cycle. Probably the most important of those is moving from globalization to what we call a post-globalization, which is a more fragmented world uh, where trade and, and investment uh, will have more barriers. Now, the, there are lots, it's easy to talk about the downsides of that, but I think the opportunities there are we go from a world that was largely, scale was unlimited in many respects. We had uh, free, free movement of goods. The larger you could get, the better. And that, that presented one set of opportunities. But as we move into a more fragmented post-global world, there'll be different opportunities, certainly in the private sector, to serve different markets that will have more localization, will have more focus domestically. Now, again, it's easy to bemoan industrial policy. And of course, China's always had industrial policy. The US uh, started quickly out of the gate with the uh, Inflation Reduction Act. But at the same time, I think this more fragmented world creates opportunities for different experiments in green energy, different ways of attacking agriculture and other commodities and different business structures for trade that I think will be uh, quite positive over this next cycle. You talk about opportunities. So, um, Parag, let, let, let's talk about those opportunities and, and the green shoots. So what do you think they are, the, the, they are the, the, the things that are going to lift growth 
prospects? Is it, is it China? Is, is it the United States? So are there any particular emerging economies? We all agree that you know, the growth must be, first of all, sustainable, uh, secondly, inclusive, and third, it has to be resilient. And uh, to achieve that target, of course, it's not easy, but you know, uh, it definitely should be inclusive and you know, all geographies uh, should be you know, uh, aligned in this regard. So uh, when we look at you know, those, you know, uh, the growth, for example, for the trade, last year the trading goods uh, were you know, below the forecasted growth. And you know, for the next year, uh, you know, the, the WTO expects that it will be 1.7%. This is nothing. So most probably, you know, uh, these new emerging uh, industries uh, will make a kind of difference. And of course, uh, the uh, services uh, trade uh, will make a difference. So when we uh, look at, you know, those, you know, uh, global uh, hotspots, you know, as the geographies, all those trends that we mentioned, you know, longer term trends like, you know, sustainability agenda, digitalization, and we all know that the, globally there is a labor challenge. I mean, we are talking about this great resignation and etc. It's all resulting in a, a huge uh, supply chain restructuring globally. I think uh, the next growth uh, will be, you know, uh, around this team. So the global supply chains are changing. Uh, different countries in different parts of the world, like, you know, in Asia, in Latin, in Africa, uh, is emerging. And in our region, you know, Turkey is at the, you know, next of Africa, Europe and Asia. We believe that Turkey is taking the advantage of this new restructuring with, uh, you know, given uh, indicators like, you know, exports are growing very rapidly, economy is growing. And uh, I think uh, this will be the new team, I mean, the restructuring of the global supply chains. And Botswana's economy is growing as well. There's growth forecasts that have increased. I mean, are there any particular sectors do you, that you're excited about? Yes, um, t tourism and, and manufacturing as well as um, the pursuit of intellectual property is something which um, we are in, in hot pursuit of. And it's um, and it's, it's an, a, 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 one which has the potential uh, of greatly, um, greatly growing the, the economy but mainly on manufacturing. Uh, we have for a long time been a, an economy which was uh, resource-based and um, not so much uh, one focused on manufacturing because it's, it's a part of industrialization, the bigger, uh, the bigger industrialization pursuit which we have embarked upon as Southern African Customs Union and also as SADC and the whole of the African continent. We are seeking to industrialize. Um, so we are, in, uh, we are um, working a great deal and also funding um, initiatives in. Uh, in, in manufacturing and also creating a climate within which industrialization can, can flourish. And in terms of the investment, Karen, that's going to, to stoke growth, it, where's hot? What's not? Well, I think when I, when I just think about the context of this panel, one of the concerns that I have is uh, when I think about the investment strategy that worked brilliantly for the last, since World War II, to lift economies really out uh, to transform them, it was export-led growth. I mean, that's what the Asian Tigers, Japan, out of World War II, China, uh, all replicated that. And if we think about a, a fragmented world with workforces that are declining in China, in Europe, in the, in the United States growing slowly, that all points to automation. And there's been a lot of talk during this session here in Geneva about, about AI, but it's much more than that. It's human hand dexterity, it's, it's sensors, all of which are disruptive. The discussion about reshoring, which has a lot of energy in North America, is predicated on automation. There simply isn't the labor to do that. And in a world where things are reshored, supply chains shift, but it's automated at the bottom of production, the question is, how do countries begin to climb that ladder of manufacturing without that labor arbitrage uh, that was so effective before? And I think that's something that I really, I'm really concerned about when I think about development strategies. Not many countries have the scale of India, both internally with markets and externally. And so that, I think, is... Uh, it, when we think about growth hotspots, it points to North America, to, to China, to those industries, but other markets will have to be more uh, creative in the strategies that they pursue. So you're talking about being creative, you're talking about being more nimble. I'm thinking, you know, Botswana is very much focused on diamonds, but there are big investments in infrastructure, aren't there? So also in technology, you mentioned tourism already. Tell us about those and the potential there for, for, for regional partnerships. It's mainly green, green technology, green energy. Um, we are, we, when we heard um, the world, whole world um, gravitating towards the abandonment of, green, of, of fossil, uh, fossil, um, fossil fuel propelled machinery, we, 
we immediately uh, set our sights on possibly uh, playing a role in the production of electric, electric machinery, electric vehicles. Uh, we accept that we are not in a position yet to manufacture a full vehicle, but in terms of harnesses and components, which are electric-based, uh, that's what we are, em and we are embarking upon. And we are, we, we are looking more, have our sights on the wealth of minerals um, that we have deposits which can be, uh, be, can be a, um, useful in our support of the, of the green technology. So we are really open. We also are very much open to, um, to solar energy because we receive about 3,200 hours of, of sunshine per annum. So it's another area which we, uh, because we, 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 we and Namibia um, are looking at. Uh, so it's an investment opportunity. Um, in, but we are really hoping that there could be some research and innovation to make it, make it uh, more sustainable and less expensive to sustain the solar energy production. Uh, because at present, we do quite know that, uh, yes, it is well, well, well and good to the ears to embark upon but the capital is a, quite a capital intensive exercise and there are challenges of storage of that kind of energy. So if there could be research, we, have, we are funding a lot of research and, and development. Uh, if there could be an, a, a breakthrough in the capacity to harness this energy and, and, um, and, and um, be a part of the, the greater scheme of the whole world of, of conducting our industrialization in a clean, in a clean manner. So, I'm really making an invitation to, um, to uh, embark on green technology. We are not, we, we are not blessed with water, so we can't look into hydroelectric power. Um, wind, yes, to some degree in the, in the southwestern part, but it's not as great as the sun opportunity that is there. So those are some of the things that are really, uh, are really um, uh, be my contribution towards um, so some, some big investment opportunities there, um, mm. scope for, for partnerships. I, mean, I wonder what the, the investment picture is like, though, in, in Turkey. Because, I mean, look, you've got eye-watering inflation. You've also had the devastating earthquakes um, and, and the fallout about that. I mean, how can all of that maybe impact the, the longer-term growth and investment outlook? Uh, first of all, uh, we would like to thank the international community, especially the international business community, for you know supporting us, for standing with us during the earthquake, and you know we are in the recovery. Uh, secondly, yeah, inflation was high; it is, uh, I mean, declining uh, very, I mean, rapidly. It's being tamed. Uh, so, uh, of course, it's a challenge for all the companies. But a, Tur a country like Turkey, we are very flexible, agile, and you know. E I think we were able to adapt our business models and etc. quickly. And election, yeah, for sometimes, you know, for emerging markets, it's like, a, you know, uncertainty, as you said. But I think for the case of Turkey, in the last two decades especially, we did many reforms. Our institutions are very strong. So for the in, in investors, especially, you know, uh, we are speaking to international investors every day, they don't have any questions. I mean, in the recent weeks, we have closed many deals. Uh, for example, tomorrow morning, uh, we are going to announce a new investment in an R&D center of a multinational employing almost 1,000 people anyway so uh, for i think that's not a you know big uncertainty it's kind of you know functioning uh, democracy thing so uh, when it comes to growth uh, if you look at the you know story of turkey in the last two decades compound annual growth rate is 5.4 percent consider the hiccups ups and downs of the global economy i think we managed to have a kind of remarkable growth and growth and this is you know what we hear all the time from international business community turkey is a resilient and fast growing economy of course uh, one of the reasons is that you know our commitment to the reform uh, agenda in the last two decades and this is a continuous uh, reform agenda and we will continue that agenda secondly we have a deep competent and competitive talent pool within the country especially you know when we consider the global uh, labor challenge i think this is a very solid value proposition lastly as i mentioned uh, we are at the next of europe asia in Africa. But this is not just the geography because we have been you know, living in that geography for a long while, especially in the two decades, we invested a lot in the infrastructure, energy, logistics, healthcare and education. And sometimes when you know, we speak about infrastructure in, digital, in emerging markets, digital infrastructure is ignored sometimes. We have been investing in digital infrastructure as well. So in addition to that, we, with our uh, successful policies, we managed to develop Turkey as a powerhouse in the region. Turkey now is a regional manufacturing hub. 
and we are driving our country to be an R&D hub in the region, to be a design house in the region. And all the global companies are now putting their regional management centers in Turkey. Just as, ex as an example, in Turkey we have more than uh, 600 multinationals having their R&D offices. So we have around 100 multi multinational companies uh, managing the region from Turkey. So these are the long-term uh, fundamental you know, value proposition of Turkey. And it will not change because of the short-term inflation. It will not be affected with the uh, earthquake or you know, uh, election. Uh, will not change it. So uh, international investors uh, are committed uh, to our country and we believe that it will continue. And this is the you know, uh, reason behind our uh, successful growth. You mentioned, Karen, um, China before and then they said recently right they want to press the accelerator button when it comes to foreign diplomacy and um, how important do you think China is going to be to robust economic recovery and changing the investment picture to stoke growth well coming out of 2008 with the world that China was the engine of growth that dragged the world out of the financial crisis it's not going to be that engine this time it even the recent GDP numbers, over 4%, still relatively disappointing uh, for hot growth coming out of COVID. And I think that just shows the, some of the structural challenges that China has. And uh, as, as they've said, trying to transition their model to a more consumer-led one, dealing with, uh, with the government debt that is accumulated uh, both nationally and regionally. That doesn't mean that China is, is not, isn't interesting for investors or doesn't have opportunities, but it, I don't see it as having that engine role pulling the world out of the global economy. And it's, it's symbolic of a more multipolar world. There isn't a country at the apex that will have that position uh, it, it, now or going forward. Is there a region at the apex? Is there a sector at the apex? There will be different regions that serve different roles. I think in this multipolar world, certainly we see uh, one hub around China, another around the United States, that decoupling in terms of advanced technology is, I don't think, reversible in a meaningful way. But that doesn't preclude other parts of the world from having that sort of strength, talking about Turkey or other areas. And I think, again, that's what's interesting. Is there an opportunity uh, more regionalized to serve, uh, to serve in a more localized interest. Saudi Arabia has done some very interesting investments in new energy, along with uh, traditional, obviously traditional fossil fuels. And uh, Ricardo Hausman, who's here with us, has noted that the more diversity in exports you have, the better your development path. And so, as we see countries begin to discuss how to find that diversity there could be new hotspots. But I wouldn't say, as an investor or someone who works with investors, I w certainly wouldn't say, you know, put it all on black with any country that's uh, on the planet right now. Gosh, you're talking about the global economy and investing like a game of Russian roulette. <laughs> or Not roulette. Russian no, roulette. No, no, roulette. Oh, roulette. Oh, forgive me. Forgive me. That, but. So you talked about in investing in new technology, but I, I wonder where, where you see those, those um, new investment opportunities to, to unlock growth, because there isn't a one-size-fits-all, is there? There really isn't. And different regions, different countries have different challenges. Definitely. I mean, all the economies are in a different stage. So we have to... And, you know, their uh, competitive advantages are different. Uh, and, you know, uh, sometimes focusing on some verticals may mislead us. You know, when you know, we encounter such question, uh, I, I try to focus on some uh, trends instead of some verticals. And of course, uh, uh, we value green economy, you know, green energy, and etc. And you know, uh, we, we talked about you know the period that we you know had in Turkey in the last two decades under the leadership of President Erdogan. Uh, you know, a very big advantage of us, he is able to read the global you know trends uh, you know very quickly, and he, he is making uh, th those decisions. I mean, our story of green energy started 15 years ago, for example. Because of that reason, you know, what we are you know, seeing now, especially for the FDI inflows in the last three years, let me give you some specific figures. Uh, so uh, one third of the investments are coming from supply chain uh, restructuring, and one third is coming from the uh, technology startups. This is the digitalization of the economy. And, you know, the, when I refer to supply chain related investments, first of all, companies are increasing their capacity within the country uh, through expansions, through greenfield investments. They are bringing their vendors or sometimes cli uh, clients to, to Turkey. And another trend is to, you know, it has been discussed that, you know, 
now we are talking about a more regionalization in the economy and you know reshoring nearshoring or friend shoring you know whatever the uh, name is and you know uh, when we look at the turkey's effort uh, we are trying to create a region of stability and you know uh, we are trying to integrate our you know geography our neighborhood we are in, uh, ratifying new free trade agreements and etc so this regional resilience and stability uh, is quite important for us so multinationals would like to you know use this opportunity to strengthen their supply chain so the companies who were manufacturing in turkey now they are bringing around the post manufacturing and pre manufacturing activities due to turkey so because uh, this is important you know to make sure that their supply chain is functioning very well a few words on the digitalization side i think all the countries has to transform their industries with the new trends i mean automation digitalization uh, and this is a fact so just a, you know another example for example in turkey we have a very strong automotive industry i mean they started manufacturing automobiles in 1960s and now the automobile world is you know e mobility it is integrated it is electrified and etc so our policies are to encourage you know those companies to catch you know up with these trends and uh, transform their, themselves So my short answer is again you know uh, the net trend you know to Turkey let's say uh, the supply chain changes are a major driving force of the FTIs and secondly that you know digital uh, digitalization of the businesses including those technology startups are major drivers uh, of investments and growth So in talking about those trends um, you know innovation ideas implementation these are these are things that forums like this have, have come to be known for I mean what What should policymakers be doing? What should businesses in emerging and in what should businesses in emerging and developing economies do to turn all of these ideas into action? Uh, p- p- policy from policymakers perspective then you got to you, you got to you got to pass policies which make it easy e- easy for investments to take root and once taken root for it to be sustained. Um, you got to pass policies which are, um, give assurance of uh, safety of investments in, in, in within territories uh, investment uh, protection but obviously from the African context we, we we do things collectively in Africa we uh, our our policies uh, by and large are informed by what the African continental free trade area the various agreements that come out of or protocols which come out of it um, say So it is very important to give assurance to um, investments and also have uh, have um, reduction or, or elimination of of um, threats to 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 security and peace I have laws which are accessible and open and um, um, have courts which are or judicial systems which which are independent uh, to which investors can look when they feel aggrieved within the the land within which they would have come in and 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 invested so i think th- those are really the the things that we we need to um we need as policy makers be looking into but it's not just a question of having a policy you've got to have to also follow it up yeah uh, follow it up and implement because a lot many times we find ourselves with policies and laws but you know the we the responsible leadership simply giving it out and rolling out to the public but then not ensuring or making sure that those that you, you leave us the ones with which you implement that policy or law they're actually so they're actually working thought, thought through they're thought through they're actually working yeah. um so um we 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 need to keep an eye on it to be sure that these policies are not just many of the documents which get churned out good to the ears and then get put away in shelves yes, i want to use the last few minutes yes. to see if there's anyone in our in our studio audience here yes. who, who've got some questions for you My name is uh, Shagawolo. I run the uh, coordination of the African Continental Free Trade for Public and yeah. Private Sector in Nigeria. Going forward, how do we uh, use well go forward with digitalization and automation? But how do we also solve unemployment? Right. Where are we going to create jobs for these young people if There we start bringing so automation? Yeah. Into Let it. me just get the panel yeah. to, to quickly go through that because our time is running out. So I think, you know, Barack, do you want to, just a, a quick fire response into that? How can you solve uh, all the, of these? <laughs> this is a very big debate, and what we see, uh, the recycling. You know, it was discussed a lot. Uh, you know, if you recycle your people, you know, according to the new business conditions, uh, you don't have to fire anybody. 
So it, it is doable. And we witnessed that in many cases, it, you know, it, this is happening in Turkey. So we are preserving employment at the same time. For example, you know, last year we generated 1.8 million jobs in Turkey. So uh, this is possible, I think, while digitalizing your economy, you can create jobs. Karen, it's a challenge. It is a challenge. When you think about the population, it's not a pyramid, it's a kite in Europe. And the lack of the bottom of the yeah. pyramid in North America, that's the incentive to speed up entry-level jobs. The bulk of the bulge of population is in actually 35 to 45, that middle management. So automation solves a problem they face. Whereas to your point, in, a, in Nigeria and in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, when you have a proper population pyramid, you don't want to be truncating those jobs. I don't have a good answer, but I, I, uh, I, I agree with you that that's a challenge. I mean, over time, new sectors emerge, but in the transition period, that does represent a real headwind. Mm. I think intra-African intra trade, which we are encouraging at AFCFT, once we increase trade within Africa itself, it may well be, or maybe result in automation not being such an, such an, after all, such a challenge. Uh, because unemployment at present is escalated by the fact that I think, um, this, I think by the fact that the way in which Africa has been trading for, for a long time, we've been really um, exporting raw materials into Europe and the Americas and, and not adding value. I'm going to have to cut you short, but big thanks to Musi Kofela, to Burak Daglio, and to Karen Harris from Bain Co. It's been upbeat, it's been interesting, and I think that we've all got a lot to Thank take you. home with us. Thanks for listening to this edition of the Agenda podcast. Do join me next week when I'll be talking Turkey as the country elects its latest president. Remember, you can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can also find more agenda content on CGTN Europe's Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Telegram, and YouTube channels. Until next time, goodbye. The most interesting questions. Are there other living beings beyond Earth? Will man or machine be in charge? Great question. Always have more than one answer. Well, hold on, uh, let me just draw up a list. And always come from more than one person. That's where the credibility lies. The concept of having a machinery which is alive and evolving didn't wait for us. The end of inequality of incomes and wealth around the world, can you imagine how difficult that is at the moment to achieve? Every episode, Stephen Cole, Murray Beveridge, and some of the brightest minds out there shed light on the answers to some of the most intriguing questions. There are two ways of looking at this. Machines can't really discriminate between civilian and military targets. The Answers Project. Maybe we need to just look at this in a bit more detail. Extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. The Answers Project, a new podcast from CGTN Europe.